Okay, we only have 15 minutes, so I'm gonna get right at it because <laughs> both of these women are so accomplished um, in corporate America and in the non-corporate American sense. So I'm gonna jump in and talk about the Jungle Gym ride in corporate America. Sal, I'm gonna start with you. We have known each other a long time, worked together at Citigroup. Yeah. You had such an incredible career in corporate America, CEO of Sanford Bernstein, Sandy Weil brings you into Citigroup, our dear friend. Um, you spend a great career at Citi, multiple jobs running Smith Barney, CFO, running wealth management, go to Bank of America, run wealth management there. Did you lean in too much to your career? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, or obviously, um, because what you were too kind to say is I've had some, you know, some public ups and some public downs as well. And as I think about it, you know, no one ever accused me of, you know, you need to try harder, you need to take more risks. Um, I think the difference between when I was very successful in taking risks and when I wasn't was the amount of support I had around me and the amount of support I managed to build. You know, so at Sanford Bernstein, we had a strategy of not doing investment banking. Very controversial at the time because the research business really made its money from investment banking and underwriting. And we decided to give up a lot of revenue not to do the investment banking. Well, that was a strategy that the group of us supported, the board, my boss, you know, my team, and we lost a lot of revenue. So I was leaning in, but someone had me by the ankles, and we did this, and then we did that. Then when Sandy brought me into City to, you know, with a team turn around Smith Barney, we had to make some controversial decisions we had to really irk some investment bankers. Sandy had me by my ankles, right? So as I was leaning in, you were there, you remember. You know, then at Smith Barney, when uh, we had the crushing downturn and uh, we lost clients' money in selling products that no one was being evil or terrible from best I can see, but uh, we sold products that were supposed to be low risk, that were high risk, were supposed to go down a handful of cents in a bad market, went down all their sense in a bad market. And I advocated uh, with my team for returning some money to clients to sort of ameliorate the, the uh, losses, despite what the fine print said. You know, I leaned in because I thought it was exactly the right long-term thing to do for the business. Nobody had my ankles, right? And it was sort of interesting because I knew the best case scenario was that we would return some of clients' money and I'd lose my job. And I knew the worst case scenario is that I would lose that battle and we wouldn't return them and I would lose my job, right? Was so, it worth it? I think, you know, um, I think it absolutely was. Standing it absolutely on was. Well, you know, I, you know, everybody knows where their sort of, their feeling is about what's right for their business or their life and mine's right here. And my right here said that we needed to do something. Yeah, were there ethics involved? Yes but it was mostly doing the right thing for the long-term business. So I was willing to take that as opposed to, as I was invited to do, sit down and shut up. <laughs> Patty, <laughs> I, you, I could talk to you for an hour. <laughs> I could talk to you for an hour too, but I know you will. Um, <laughs> you, at Microsoft, you rose up in, in over nine years to be the most senior woman in the company. Um, you oversaw interactive media, the launch of MSNBC, Slate, digital, all kinds of digital things, you know, a long time ago, and you retired at age 40. Why? Well, I think that almost everyone here knows that even the best jobs in the world have a sell-by date. And I don't mean sell-by in the market sense, I mean sell-by in the cream in your refrigerator sense, right? That it's fabulous at one point, and then you start to think, ooh, I hope it's still good, and then eventually it just starts to, you don't want to use it anymore. And, you know, this was true in my fabulous run in software, one of the best jobs in the world. The same with the opportunity in philanthropy. That's what the jungle gym is all about, is recognizing before it really starts to go bad that you are, are seeking passion in a different way, that you're ready for another run, uh, and that's, that's all it was. What, what did you learn from Bill Gates? Well, I think the same issue that, that uh, Sally said eloquently, which is, you know, take big risks, but make sure you've got a team around you. Make sure that there are a lot of people who have hit uh, that idea, that issue, 
multiple ways and multiple angles and really have that dialogue that ensures that you're going as a team. Sally, um, you know, at Citigroup, um, when we were both involved with Women & Co., the women's <laughs> financial services business, um, you know, you came and you spoke at events to clients, and yet um, New York Magazine at one point said you've had a feminist awakening since you, you got <laughs> off the corporate jungle gym. Um, what, did, what, did the, what did New York Magazine mean by that? Yeah. Were, you, were you late to the, to the feminist party? Yeah, and actually, I, you know, I hope we all keep learning, right? You know, there's sort of a view in media that you, you know, you said something 15 years ago, defend it. <laughs> and if we're not going to keep learning and changing and incorporating new information into our careers, you know, shame on us. And so, you know, as I think about my time at, at Smith Barney, for example, where we had, when I came in, we had to turn it around. We'd done wrong by clients. Think about the actualization, you know, sort of the hierarchy of needs. I mean, we, need to, we, said, we had to say, stop recommending stocks and saying ugly things about them behind them. You know, it wasn't at that point, and we need to get one more senior woman in business, right? So you have to have this sort of hierarchy. But as I've gone through and as I've had the chance to reflect about what matters in business in a macro basis, and you know, for me, as I think about my career, I want to keep learning and I want to always make a difference. And so as I, as the recovering research analyst that I am, looked at what can actually help our economic prosperity. I didn't say growth, I said prosperity. So we grow but don't have those violent ups and downs. Every bit of research I see shows that having more women in senior roles does good things, higher ROEs, lower volatility, more long-term perspective, uh, better stockholder returns, greater innovation. And so as I looked at the next stage of my career, it wasn't about can I get a bigger job than I had before. It was about what can I do that can make an impact. Patty, you have been making an impact for really most of your career. Um, whether it was at Microsoft and Corporate America, and then in the nonprofit world, you, you conceived and helped conceive and ran the Gates Foundation. You chaired the Board of Regents at the Smithsonian. Um, you are chairing a, a White House council that the president has set up to help uh, kids who are not, not in school and not working. And now you're running Martha's Table. You've gone to the front line right here in, in Washington, D.C. Is service your calling? Well, I. I'm one of those people who really does know, like Sally says, what drives me, and there are two things. One is increasing knowledge, something my family hammered into me as essential. My father never got a college degree. I'm one of nine kids. It was clear that that was the path forward. And social justice, which my family was equally passionate about, and they managed to pass that to all of us. And so my family executes on that different ways. I thought the tech world, there was no better way to ensure an increase of knowledge. And I think that's played out in the last 20 years, the freedom and the, of information to change the lives of people who wouldn't have access to great knowledge. The second thing, though, of the social justice, I got an enormous chance at the Gates Foundation to think big and work on uh, big ideas and big strategies and big partnerships to increase social justice, whether that was in health or education. But I had this aha moment when I finished my work there and looked at the first decade of this century, and the childhood poverty in the U.S. had gone up from 2000 to 2010, where I was doing such a, you know, great job. The the numbers looked worse, and certainly there were. E real economic reasons for that, but at the same time we know that, the billi that billions were cut out of the social supports in the government system uh, that is normally providing the nutrition and health and educational supports. So I looked at that and said, I just don't understand it. And I was done being a benevolent bureaucrat. One more white paper, one more PowerPoint presentation, one more, I won't say McKinsey, but consultant-aided strategy just wasn't, wasn't where I wanted to go. I wanted to go stand with the families that were trying to break the cycle of poverty. The teacher Neff in our, in, at Martha's Table who teaches science to our children now but was a child there at Martha's Table seeking food supports 20 years ago. And see what was happening with Neff and her child, what's happening with Eric and his child. And, and it's part of that same 
construct and services the right way for me to do it. Is it true that you uh, did try living on food stamps for $4 a day? Is that, is that a I, I, I it more than tried. I made it one week. And the people that I'm working with, the, the 300 families that received grocery supports from Martha's Table yesterday, are doing it all month. And we know 90% of, of food stamp benefits run out in the third week. So we have this very bad business model where we push groceries and produce out in that fourth week of the month, in the second half of the month, and we twiddle our thumbs hoping people need us in the first half. I'm, I'm being somewhat facetious, but the real need is in the latter half because not only is it almost impossible to do it on $1.50 a day, but we know from the big grocers that the grocery basket is full of nutritious food, the first grocery basket of the month. The second one, it starts to be full of carbs and lower cost, higher filling items. And the third, you just don't even wanna think about what happens when your dollars are down that low. So I learned that myself that it had, it had been since I was in college when I ate as many cremettes as I did that week, right? That, bi that big box of macaroni will go a long way. And that one pot of chili stretched the whole week. Yeah. And it was boring, and it was really hard to make those dollars stretch. Pet Sally, you, um, you bought 85 broads, um, and you're now active in the digital media. Um, Two-part question, what are you trying to do with 85 broads? And do you think your two passions, financial services, and now I'm gonna say digital media, are complementary of one another or at odds in trying to help women? I don't know that, um, it's, I don't know many people would say they have a passion about financial services. Um, but I, I do, I do. Um, I, I have to admit it. Um, the, the reason for uh, becoming involved with and buying 85 Broads, which is a professional women's network, um, 30 plus thousand strong, um, is that, you know, as I thought about the levers to advancing women, which, you know, as I mentioned, lead to greater economic prosperity and, and better corporate performance, and within companies, lower gender pay disparity. So it really trickles throughout the, the company. Um, the number one unwritten rule of success in business is networking for everyone. And what the research shows, whether we sort of like to say it or not, is that people are more comfortable networking with their own gender. The questions they can ask, that you and I have asked each other in the past, hey, hey Lisa, you know, in the halls of the company, or, should I be on Twitter? Should, you know, mm -hmm. how, how'd you, did you get a raise? How'd yeah. you do it? Yeah. Um, those questions we're more comfortable asking of our own gender. And so, you know, in, you know, sort of below, and we see this here, when we're all here and in the halls afterwards, the conversations that occur. And so providing that capability through, as, as I call it, the cheekily named 85 broads to women, not just in financial services, but it's around the world um, and across industries, for women who are primarily in their 30s and 40s, seem to me to be a tool to help them move forward. Um, not immediately related to financial services, so the roots are in financial services. Right. right. Patty, you have a great phrase that I read, which um, is, um, a, a trusteeship period, right? That when you get off the corporate jungle gym, both of you, um, y there's a, a, a movement that you've seen, perhaps or not, of corporate women becoming um, more trustees uh, of, of doing very meaningful things. Um, you've clearly led that. Um, do you see it as a downshifting or do you see it as a reorientation uh, of, of, your, of your passions. The puzzles and the problems and even the stresses that I take on now are equal to the work at the Gates Foundation, the work at uh, Microsoft. I still have to meditate before I go to bed in order to make sure that I'm not problem solving all night long. I, I drink wine for that. <laughs> <laughs> I try to manage that part and do the meditation instead. Um, so I, it isn't downshifting, it is, it is, I thought that, you know, I didn't know that this was gonna be called the career jungle gym until they mailed me the, the information. But I think that's absolutely right. It's, just, it's another, it's a sideways move and you're grabbing, you're really reaching into air. It's still reaching into air. You don't know whether you're going to have the certainty. And in fact, I think the risk of my failing is greater now than it was at Microsoft. Technology was moving fast at Gates Foundation, thanks to Warren and, and Bill and Melinda and their generosity. It would have been hard not to move the ball forward some, but 
I'm really worried about Eric and Shamar. I'm really worried about Edwin, who started, this, who started preschool the same day I started at Martha's Table, and trying to think about, are we doing what these families and these children need to change the cycle, to change their future, and are we standing with them rather than handing out to them in a way that really empowers them. I think the risk is just as much, the puzzles are just as interesting mm -hmm. and challenging. Um, the power is a lot less. Yep. So I'm really grateful, by the way, that, that Fortune has me here because I've been here on other platforms, but I know the most powerful women I know today are handing out groceries tonight yep. at Henley Elementary to 500 families. And you know they benefit from the kind of knowledge and sharing here um, but they don't usually get on this stage. But it, w one point, I mean, it's something for everyone in the room to think about because we women live six to eight years longer than the guys. We live healthier than the guys do. And it's rare that any of us will join a company at 22 and still be there at 68. And so for us to think about, you know, as you work through your career, where that passion lies and putting together you know, engaging careers for ourselves through the course of our lives and making a difference where it matters and using the capabilities, be it social media, this platform, et cetera, to make a difference really matters for folks. Um, this could go on forever, and I hate that we're out of time, but I wanna leave everybody with a quote from Patty that I think is meaningful um, and gives us all food for thought, which is, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I think it's an appropriate place to end the conversation. Thank you both. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Sally.